Welcome to Film Speak. I'm going to analyze a segment of a feature length screenplay derived from Jack Conway's action adventure film Tarzan and His Mate, and, but we're going to call our clip Tarzan of the Apes. Um, we're going to look at roughly eight scenes from what would have been about a 90 minute movie. Tarzan and His Mate was a 1934 American pre code action adventure film based on characters created by Edgar Rice Burroughs. It is the second in the Tarzan film series starring Johnny Weissmiller. In the credits, the film is said to have been uh, directed by Cedric Gibbons, although much of the film uh, after the first few weeks was actually directed by un, uh, the unaccredited Jack Conway. This was the second of five films in which Maureen O'Sullivan played the part of Tarzan's mate. Uh, O'Sullivan, by the way, was Mia Farrow's mother. By the 1930s, Hollywood had uh, borrowed many of the cinematic ideas pioneered by the directors of Weimar Germany, especially the use of strong backlighting. However, Technicolor film stock was insensitive to light, thus forcing cinematographers to use overall flat lighting. With the rise of the rigid censorship of the Hays Code production, um, after this film was made, uh, Jane's scanty clothing and nudity and rampant sexuality with Tarzan would disappear in future installments. So in 1934, George Mitchell made the cumbersome sound blimps obsolete with the introduction of the self-blimped Mitchell BNC. Tarzan is Mate was one of the first films to use the Mitchell BNC. Just to show you the difference between the two types of cameras, here's uh, this picture we see Alfred Hitchcock directing, I think is Lady Vanishes. Uh, anyway, the camera to his left is an example of one of those cumbersome blimped cameras. And here's Orson Welles with the self-blimped Mitchell BNC. <laughs> So what we're going to try to do is discover the movie making process through the eyes of the director who would have made this early sound film. Therefore, many of the historical restrictions reflect not only the limitations of the technology, but also the perspective of the filmmakers at the time. For instance, Hollywood at this time fared this stylistic approach that emphasized telling a story in a way that audiences thought it would be entertaining. Hence, many of the studios mandated rigid guidelines regarding staging, cinematography, editing, and sound. There are four actors, of which two have starring roles and two have supporting roles. In other words, everyone has lines, including Tarzan. Uh, there are four sets and one location. The location will include a special fact. It will be an early use of rear screen projection. By this time, most studio films were shot on sets as it was less expensive and more convenient than shooting on location. It also allowed for much more control of the lighting and set design. We open with a long shot of Tarzan approaching an opening in the jungle and we hear voices in the background. And one of the editing rules of many of the studios enforced at this time was the idea that you always open with an establishing shot showing where the story takes place. Especially when you're establishing a new scene, it was uh, considered very important to orientate the audience as to the setting of the story. Now that we've established that Tarzan is in a jungle, we can go in for a close-up. This approach to editing was typical of most studio pictures at this time, establishing a long shot, then going in for coverage. By the way, it was not uncommon for screenplay writers at this time to put screen directions into the script. Then you haven't completely lost your interest in clothes. Now what woman ever does? No smart one. This is another establishing shot, but this is done to show the audience where everybody is standing in relationship to each other. Jane says, oh, 
they're wearing sleeveless this season. Holt replies, hold it up to yourself and see how you look in the mirror. Uh, this shot reestablishes the positions of all the actors in relationship to each other. In those days, it was very important to make it clear to the audience exactly what was going on. Darling. Well, give me a little credit. I shopped all over Paris to get the boy This entire scene would have been shot on stage. The background would have been a painted psych. However, many of these trees would have been actual trees. Now, Arlington says here, you fool, Holt, you'll never get away with this. Now, this shot has a key light placed over the lens in order to flatten out the image. It further flattened out by the use of a 100 millimeter focal length. I probably wouldn't know how to wear this anyway. Try it on. Yes, we care out of your boudoir. Holt says, what is it, dear? Holt cries out to Jane, wait, you haven't tried it on. He then asks Harlington, couldn't she see there was more? Here is a tracking shot of Jane climbing up a tree. And then the camera meets her up at the top, high up in the canopy of the forest. Essentially, we skip all the time spent climbing up the tree. A unique characteristic of film is the ability to condense time. In this shot, the camera slowly tracks left as Jane walks down the tree trunk. Uh, so the background is a painted psych of a jungle canopy ceiling. In other words, the background psych is completely different perspective from that of the foreground. We look at Jane and the tree trunk from an eye level perspective, but the psych is seen from the point of view of looking up into the canopy. This is a little example of a Vimerian influence. The camera move in this shot would be considered a motivated camera move. It's hidden by Jane's movement, therefore we don't notice it. A snake slips into the foreground on screen left. This would be our first special effect as the snake would probably be a mechanical model. Uh, cuts from Jane reacting to the snake and the close-up of the snake is a simple example of the question-answer patterning found in classic Hollywood film continuity. Back to the jungle camp where Tarzan discovers that the chest is full of hukatu. During this period, the acting style was becoming a little more naturalistic. The emphasis on facial expressions, body language, and stylized gestures of the silent air gave away to straightforward approach that relied on the actor's ability to deliver convincing but expressive dialogue. Holt says, well, Arlington says, I suppose you have a little explaining to do. And Holt sheepishly replies, I didn't want her to catch a cold. Uh, now, this scene would have been shot outdoors. This exterior location would have been shot in Tahunga Canyon in the San Gabriel Mountains using one of the lions from the MGM Zoo. Yes, MGM did have a zoo. And of course, this would be a cutaway in a completely different location. An interesting statistic. During this period, the average shooting ratios ran around 10 to 1. However, today, because cinema is becoming more digitalized, the average shooting ratios are around 30 to 1. The actor playing Tarzan here would have most likely done his own stunts. This would have been shot on a sound stage. The trees and vines would have been manufactured. Now this here is our second special effect and more accurately, a visual effect. This is the use of rear screen projection. Ah! 
a large screen would have been set up on location. Then footage of the lion running towards the camera would be projected onto the screen from behind the actor. The actor would run in front of the screen, giving the illusion that she was being chased by the lion. Believe it or not, a real lion would have been used in this shot. In those days, MGM had a pool of trained lions. I would imagine that it would have taken a film director at this time roughly four or five days to shoot this sequence of nine scenes. I think all of the stage shots would have been done in a couple of days. The special effects would have taken the longest, probably two or three days. Of course, all the real screen projection would have been done on second unit and then shot ahead of principal photography. <laughs> 